Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Melbourne Broadcasting um, from all graduates. Um, where uh, uh, we have a session today on cultural awareness um, of Kurdish culture and language. And uh, we have uh, um, uh, a number of presenters here who will be presenting. Um, I'll uh, firstly introduce ourselves. We, um, the, uh, well, just to say that All Graduates believes that it's very important for organisations like yours. We have people from um, uh, local government in particular, including in West Australia, welcome, um, uh, to, uh, to understand this often quite complicated um, issue of, to, of, of Kurdish language and Kurdish culture and who are the Kurds and what is Kurdistan. Um, firstly, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Aldous Ozelens. I'm a long-time educator and researcher in, uh, in interpreting and translation, and I've been working with all graduates for a number of years, uh, both training interpreters and uh, also presenting sessions like these on many different cultures. Um, I have with me, uh, I'll get him to introduce himself, Shorj Ahmad. Please. Uh, I'm Shorj Ahmad. Uh, actually, I have a PhD in media. Uh, I'm working as interpreter since 2009. Uh, I can say in all around Australia and all the offshore campus. And I'm working with uh, different companies or graduate on call, TEAS National, uh, Beats, uh, since 2009 all together. And still I'm continuing. Good, thank you. And we also have. Uh... Uh, Shabu Shariati, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Shabu. Uh, I'm from Kurdistan, part of Iran, and uh, I have bachelor in English translation into uh, from English to Persian. I've been living in Australia for nine years, and I've been doing interpreting back here in Iran and also here in Persian and in Kurdish. And uh, our participant, Shireen Bagpa, uh, could you introduce yourself briefly? Good afternoon. My name is Shireen. I am a Kurdish and Persian interpreter since 2009. As uh, Shurish uh, mentioned, I've also worked in onshore and offshore detentions and immigration detention centers and uh, currently studying international studies and uh, also performing um, on-site um, interpreting jobs in Melbourne. Good, thank you very much. Um, I'll share the uh, PowerPoint now. At the beginning, I should say that you had, uh, all the participants were sent copies of the PowerPoint slides, um, so you can refer to them, but I'll put them on the screen as well. Um, and uh, that's our participants um, and uh, uh, the All Graduates logo um, where we're broadcasting from. Um, I'll uh, uh, just uh, begin uh, with what are we talking about? We're talking about Kurdish languages and cultures that occupy this highly complex part of the Middle East. Um, the, uh, there is, uh, we'll talk later about uh, uh, Kurdistan or the Kurds being a, a nation without a state, but they're spread out over um, some of the more conflict-ridden areas of the Middle East, and we'll hear a bit about that. Um, the three main varieties, and uh, we'll call them varieties uh, of the Kurdish language, uh, Kurmanji, Sarani and Southern, we'll go through those. Um, they're in the uh, green shades, there's a number of other um, much smaller minority languages that are spread out over this area as well that can be identified as Kurdish varieties, but they really don't figure um, in demands for language services in Australia, so we'll not be referring to them. Um, we'll be referring mostly to the, uh, the three that I, I, I mentioned there. Um, now, uh, it is confusing for people to un uh, when they say, oh, we need a Kurdish interpreter, and the uh, uh, question comes back from the language service provider, what variety of Kurdish do you need? 
and uh, hopefully um, one of the main aims of this um, session is precisely to be able to answer those sort of questions, what questions you need to ask of clients, of non-English speakers, et cetera, et cetera, to get the language, the right language variety. We'll start off, um, and I'll ask Shorsh to talk about Kurdish Kurmanji, which is uh, also known as Northern Kurdish, and it is spread out um, through a number of countries um, uh, across various borders, um, and uh, but uh, Shorsh, maybe you could tell us about this language um, and the background to this language. Okay, uh, I think uh, as uh, Doctor mentioned, uh, there's a one Kurdish language. We have to know one Kurdish language but different dialect. Actually, in Kurdistan, if we're asking about the language, we have a 72 uh, dialects, 72 dialects in all Kurdistan, but the majority is a uh, three dialects, Kurmanji, Sorani, and uh, Ayli. Uh, Kurmanji, actually, from the east of uh, Turkey, uh, actually, we can say from uh, one city until uh, all the south, from the east to the west of Turkey until Askandaruna. Uh, I can say uh, something, maybe uh, sometimes they're asking uh, why you're talking about some politics. Actually, the Kurdish issue, when we're talking about the language or anything uh, related to Kurdish, we have to talk about the politics because politics divided us. Politics make it as uh, like a separate. So in this case, if you want to mention uh, or describe the Kurdish Kurmanji from east, of, as I said, from east of Turkey and to the west, which is uh, Askandaruna city, and all the north, uh, north of Syria as well, from the east, uh, from Khamishlo city until uh, Afrin. And the north of Iraq as well, we have a, uh, uh, from, uh, we can we can divide uh, Kurdistan in the north of Iraq to three parts. Uh, the top of the north from Dohok, Zaho until Shingar, Kuwait, and connection with the Syria that they, they speak in uh, Kurmanji. Badini is a Kurmanji. Uh, that why all of them together. And Sulaymaniya, Erbil, Kirkuk, uh, to the down they speak in uh, Sorani, which is they connect in with Sinandish, uh, Mahabad, Saqiz, Bokan from the east of Kurdistan. We go to the down, uh, Khanaqin, Mandali, uh, uh, Kut, which is that in Wasan, and then to Ilam, all the uh, speaking Kurdish Ilami, or uh, you can say uh, fairly. Uh, there's the Kurdish Kurmanji. Uh, we have a difficulty with the Kurdish Kurmanji because the, the people speaking Kurdish Kurmanji in Turkey, they mixed with the Turkish language. You know, in the Turkey until now, uh, they don't allow to speak Kurdish. I was in Turkey as well. Uh, I lived for nearly two years. Uh, I remember one day I went to the police station and one of the officers was uh, Kurdish Kurmanji. Uh, I took the opportunity and uh, which I was con uh, communicating with the you know, Kurdish Kurmanji, and uh, the officer, the higher rank, rank uh, came and said, why are you speaking Kurdish? You are in police station in Turkey, you're not allowed. So that, that's exactly the example. Uh, Kurdish people in Turkey, they're not allowed to speak uh, Kurdish and educate in school as well. In the Kurdish that way, uh, the people they mix it with the Turkish language. Is uh, for the interpreter, if you want to speak Kurdish Kurmanji, they have to be familiar with the Turkish language as well, because sometimes there's a word from Turkish coming to Kurdish Kurmanji. And in Syria, because they, they know allow it as well, they don't have a, even citizenship in, in Syria. Uh, they know allowed to speak Kurdish as well. They don't educate in Kurdish, so they mix with Arabic. For the interpreter or translator, for Kurdish Kurmanji is, I think, I think I say highly very difficult. You have to be familiar with Arabic language for Kurdish Kurmanji in Syria, and Turkish language and Kurdish Kurmanji in uh, the south of Turkey. But the little part of uh, 
northern Iraq, which is we say South Kurdistan, uh, now is good because before they was mixed with Arabic, when the time uh, Saddam Hussein was in power and make it Arabic language the first language, but when he is gone, uh, now the Kurdish language the first, slowly, slowly they mixed with the Kurdish Sorani, and now it's a little bit uh, good, uh, because while I'm, I'm interpreting and translating for Kurdish Kurmanji uh, and mostly the Yazidi, uh, I can correct something, it's not Yazidi, because Yazidi is different from Yazidi. Okay. Yazidi, it means uh, the, the Allah, uh, uh, Imam Ali's uh, followers, which is Shia, but SD, that are real Kurdish, they are because they are Kurdish. Them language is a Kurmanji, but, but very light, very uh, nice, very, uh, I can say, uh, very clear, uh, mostly uh, connected with the Sorani. Uh, for, for me, it's very easy. I can uh, uh, interpret and, and translate as well. Uh, that's all about uh, that, the, the language, but uh, one I, I can say uh, if they're asking me for uh, when you ask the client, I think the best thing is you ask the client which dialect you speak in, which dialect of Kurdish, straight away, because in Kurdish is easy. Uh, I can say in Kurdish said, uh, uh, certainly, I tell you, I'm um, Bailey, Sorani, Kurmanji, you can uh, talk to you. That's the best way uh, to speak with you. Good, thank you. Could I, I, I um, uh, remind uh, uh, our uh, listeners that it is possible to send through questions to us, so we're happy to answer questions. Now, we will get back to some of these um, things uh, in this presentation. We'll get back to some of the politics and we'll get back to the Azidi um, that George uh, briefly mentioned. But I'd like to go on and uh, uh, now um, look at uh, uh, the next, uh, next uh, language variety, Kurdish Sarani, uh, sometimes also known as Central Kurdish. And uh, uh, it's a smaller language. Um, these, all these figures for languages are approximate, um, but um, uh, they they give you some idea of the of the numbers in these uh, in these different uh, in these different countries. But I'll ask Shabu now to talk about um, Kurdish Sorani. Wait. Before starting, I do apologize because of moving around. I have some back issue. I can't sit still. Uh, well, uh, Iranian Kurdistan, also known as Eastern Kurdistan, is an unofficial name given to a region in Western Iran, which is inhabited by Kurds. The region forms a distinct cultural geographical territory, uh, which is called Kurdistan. Kurdish are the third largest ethnicity in Iran. Kurdish-speaking people live in six provinces of Iran, like Kurdistan, Ilam, Kermanshah, West Azerbaijan, and so on. Uh, Kalhuri and Feili are spoken in Kermanshah and Ilam, uh, respectively. An estimated 12 million Kurds live in Iran, largely rural until the late 1960s. The Kurdish population is now more than 75% urbanized. In Iran, uh, Kurdish is recognized as a regional language. It is used in some local media, but not in public school. Kurdish began to appear in writing in a version of uh, the Persian alphabet uh, during the 7th uh, century AD. The exact number of Sorani speakers is difficult to determine. Uh, but it is generally thought that the uh, Sorani is spoken by about 9 to 10 million people in Iran and Iraq. And uh, as I gather, it is the most widespread speech of Kurds in Iran and in Iraq. Kurdish has been a literary language for over a thousand years. The Kurdish that I speak is Sorani Erdalani, 
the dialect is Eric Sorani, Erdalani, and spoken in the city like Senandet, my hometown, or Sna, Sakres, Marivan, and some other cities in Iran. Kurdish dialects are highly differentiated and uh, are not mutually intelligible all the time because uh, it's been suggested that two main dialects can be treated as separate languages. The example which has been mentioned, it's just like comparing in terms of grammar and structure and vocabulary sometimes. It's like comparing German and Dutch. My point is, Kumanji and Sorani have written forms and they have been written both in Arabic and Latin alphabet. But the problem is, as Sorani is a low resource language, no corpus, including text, was available. And that's why it's not easy to determine that. But the amount of Sorani language content of the web nowadays, it's been increasing. And that's it provided good, you know, uh, source of data for building a corpora. The Kurds, I'm talking about Kurds of Iran, part of Iran. The Kurds cannot necessarily read or write their own mother tongue. I was one of them because I acquired my mother tongue. I've never been taught. Like, you know, as a growing up, one of my first, you know, a uh, challenge that I had, it was to pick the Persian language, the official language of the country where I live, you know, properly. Because all the time at the back of my mind, that, that was that fear. What if I mispronounce some things? You know, in terms of the articulation place, for a Kurd, it's not easy to pronounce some, you know, sound, some, you know, vowel or consent or anything. That's why all the time the fear of being bullied, especially when I you know, travel to Persian countries or when I had something to do with my Persian friends, you know, all the time that was at the back of my mind. Okay, what if I misspelled? What if I mispronounced some things? And, you know, I ended up being, you know, bullied. That is the first challenge for a Kurdish person. I'm talking about the Kurds who live in Iran and the dominant language, the official national language is Persian. And uh, as uh, Kakshorish mentioned, there are heaps of, you know, loan vocabulary from Persian, which uh, that's why uh, it's easy for some of the Persian, you know, say, oh, we can pick your language, we can understand, we can get that. Yeah, that's right, because of those, you know, loan word vocabularies and loan words. And historically speaking, Persian has been declared as an official language in Iran in three uh, stages. That's why Kurdish been affected. That first of them on 1906, when uh, Muzaffar Din Shah of Qajar, you know, signed Mashrute law. It was Persian constitutional, you know, revolution. And uh, at that time, Persian was declared as a official language, but other ethnic languages, you know, were free. Second stage, when Reza Shah Pahlavi, that is, that's very important, you know, uh, issued a rule in 1932 and imposing Persian language on all states and forbid any other language, including Kurdish. And it's what's surprising, the Kurdish language was announced as a local dialect of Persian and the Kurds are and were considered as mountainous Iranian. And the third stage, yeah, and the third stage dates back to 1979 Islamic Revolution. They declared Persian as an official language and I think in Article 15 they issued that, you know, Kurdish can be taught and can be used as a regional language. But uh, honestly, as far as I remember, that article never been implemented and uh, fully implemented. Still, there are some, you know, departments of Kurdish language and literature, like in Kurdistan University in my hometown being established. And in some school, in some city, Kurdish is being taught, as far as I'm aware of that. 
but uh, and also um, there is a TV channel, you know, like the uh, Sahar, uh, which uh, 22 hours they broadcast in Sorani Kurdish and two hours in uh, Kermanji. But, uh, you know, uh, this is the situation of the Sorani and the reason all the time, you know, it's very hard to find the exact number of the Kurds or the Sorani speaking Kurdish of this status and all it's unknown. The reason is that, that about this uncertainty is that the exact number of Kurds is usually not publicized officially in the four main countries. And even now in Australia, as uh, you know, earlier Kakshoresh mentioned that uh, during the census, you know, most of the people introduce themselves as Iranian and Turkish, you know, because they do consider the place of born, you know, not the, you know, the race or ethnicity. Um, I've got a question there immediately from one of the participants. Um, are you saying that Sarani is not a written language at all? No, Sarani, it's a written language. But my point is, in my in Kurdistan of Iran, Sarani is not being taught. I mean, in terms of writing and reading. That's why it was one of my challenge later on when I traveled to Kurdistan of Iraq, and when I tried to do some, you know, translation done and some to do some things because I was I didn't know. I wasn't aware of the alphabet the structure and the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yep, good, thanks. And and uh, in terms of the alphabet, um, uh, Kurdish Sarani is written in a Latin alphabet or a Persian alphabet? Uh, in or Persian, a, Persian, uh, Persian Arabic, Arabic, Persian Arabic alphabet, but Kurmanji is uh, Latin as far as I know. Kakor Shoresh can add something if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, Good, thanks. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, um, if I may, uh, to the third, uh, the third variety that we're going to look at, which is um, southern, or uh, it's already been referred to as Thali, which is the largest uh, variety of the southern Kurdish variety. Um, now, uh, we've had some uh, comments on the figures here. Just one thing before I let Shirin talk on this is that if you have a look at the figures um, of the speakers, they would, even though it's hard to determine them exactly, they are approximately the same figures as the population of Australia. So we're talking about quite a sizable population across, uh, across Kurdistan. Um, Shirin, would you like to talk about the Southern Kurdish, uh, which is in Eastern Iraq and Western Iran, and uh, it's often referred to as Faili. Sure. As my two lovely colleagues here um, pointed out a lot of uh, points about uh, politics and religions and all other aspects of it, um, I myself um, obviously am a Kurdish Faili. Um, majority of us um, used to live in, uh, originally are from the Iran side of the borders, since we don't have um, our own country at the moment, um, from the western part, uh, eastern part of Iran and western part of Iraq. Um, my family, like a lot of other Kurdish families, moved from Iran um, in 1950s to Iraq um, for employment mainly and lived there for a generation or two. But then during Saddam Hussein in 1970s and later on in 1979, um, two major groups of the Kurdish families were deported to Iran, um, classified as being Iranians. Um, majority of those people, including my own family, we um, I was born in Iran and grew up in Iran, but um, unfortunately we are non-citizens even at this point of time, because as the Iraqi government did not recognize us as Iraqis and our parents or grandparents did not obtain um, Iraqi documents, when we were returned or deported to Iran, Iranian government did the same thing. It was in 1979, a year after that, the Iran-Iraq war happened. So we were just pushed to the side. And uh, 40 years on, we're still not citizens. Um, out of, I think, uh, I always say that the Kurdish families are the minority within a minority, because Kurdish people in general are a minority within the Middle East, um, especially we are 
the biggest nation without a state and not having a state has its own limitations. And Kurdish failures are a minority within that minority when it comes to religion, when it comes to um, dialect of the language that we speak. Um, and for example, Kurdish failures, majority of Kurdish failures are Shia Muslims. Um, unlike uh, Kurmanji or Surani, which come from either Sunni part of Muslims or the Zoroastrians, or we also have Christians and Jews as well. Um, but when it comes to failures, as far as I know, we are all Shia Muslim, uh, Shia Muslims. Um, of those of who arrived in Australia by boat, um, I think majority from 2000 and 2000, 2001, came from uh, Kurdish Faili backgrounds, um, either from Elam or Kermansha, um, due to not being non-citizens, they claim asylum um, in Australia. But then the second group also arrived um, in early 2010, late 2009 maybe. Um, and majority of those who also arrived by boat to Australia, the recent uh, migra migrants that we had to, as interpreters, work with, are from uh, Faili backgrounds as well. Um, regarding of where we usually, education wise, as uh, my lovely co um, colleague Shabu saying, um, like the Suranis, uh, Iranian Kurdish families who live in Iraq or live in Iran don't have access to um, Kurdish education. Um, we are mainly um, educated in Iraqi, um, in Arabic or in Farsi, and that's if you are a citizen. Um, for majority of my family members who are not citizens of Iran or Iraq, they haven't had the opportunity of um, going through schooling um, in in a normal formal setting. So either privately or then no certificates, you're not allowed to have a year 12 certificate even if you finish and therefore you're unable to attend university. So there's a lot of limitation that comes with being Kurdish failure. Um, I know big, the, the problem that we had for language-wise, I know in one stage um, that um, Kurdistan in Iraq was uh, opened up its university doors to other Kurds from all around other Kurdish areas in any other country. And a uh, couple of my cousins um, and myself tried to like, okay, we'll go there, we've got to go to university because we can't do it in Iran or Iraq. But then we had problems speaking Surani I mean, intelligible, I, I could understand them, but I think to be able to be educated in another dialect of Kurdish required a lot more um, intelligibility of Surani dialect. So therefore, it's very important for stakeholders not to make assumption when they uh, make a booking for a Kurdish interpreter, just simply ask, which dialect do you speak? Or even like the, with the place of birth, could kind of give an indication um, like if they were born in Syria or uh, Turkey, they must probably speak Kermanji. But when it comes to Iran and Iraq, you definitely need to ask the question. Because I have been to interpreting assignments, even over the phone, that they are Kermanjis. The client just says Kurdish, but I think it's the agency's responsibility to make it clear what dialect of Kurdish. It is very good that these sessions like this occurs, so the agency is aware of this challenges and differences between different dialects. Good, thank you very much. Um, we'll go on and... Uh, uh, sorry, get the, the screen up again. Uh, there was just, um, I'm sorry, the screen seems frozen. Um, just one more question that has come in. Uh, that's the one we already answered, yes. Um, I'm sorry, we're having some technical difficulties with the... With the presentation. Should... Okay, 
Good, thanks. The, uh, I'm sorry, I put the, the map up once again just to um, show this. Um, with the, uh, and, and just to remind you that um, whenever you see a straight line on the map in the Middle East, it means it was drawn up by some colonial power. Um, when you see a wiggly line in the Middle East, um, it means it was fought out by the people in that country, though they also often didn't um, recognise the minorities within their own country. So uh, that gives you some idea of the, uh, of the, of the complexity that we've got. Um, in terms of settlement in Australia, just to run through this um, fairly, uh, fairly quickly, at the 2016 census, we, um, on the ancestry question, you remember the, uh, um, the, the census asks for people's ancestry and about 10,000 identify as having Kurdish ancestry. Now, this is always a question which people will interpret in their own way uh, and there isn't always a clear one-for-one uh, -one relationship between um, ancestry and speaking because approximately 6,000 people um, said that they speak varieties of Kurdish at home. So, um, which, which, which is very common in many migrant communities that not everyone who recognise themselves as having that ancestry um, will also speak that language. But the 6,000 speaking, um, speaking Kurdish, that's a, a sizable um, minority. The pattern of migration, and we've now heard about from Turkey, um, from Syria and Lebanon, and um, uh, now from Iraq and Iran, it's really come in waves. So that uh, back to the 60s um, uh, and uh, certainly the only Kurds I ever heard of were, were from Turkey and there was uh, a lot of politics associated with that. But in the, in the 70s, um, they started coming from other places and then most recently, and as we've heard from Shabu and Shirin, um, from uh, Iraq and Iran. So there's been a change in the background of the, of, of the, Kurdish, um, of the Kurdish settlers. Um, there's also been about uh, uh, a number of Yazidi. Now we'll talk about the Yazidi in a minute, but they are, are a separate group that largely speaks Kurmanji, but don't necessarily identify themselves as Kurds. So even within this area, there are, there are problems of identifying language with ethnicity and uh, who, that, that old age question of who are you. Um, so we've been talking about the, um, the correct identification uh, and um, what service providers need to know. And I think that all three um, speakers have, have stressed that you always need to ask for the variety or the dialect of Kurdish that you, um, that you need to uh, uh, ask for as a service provider. Um, and um, the Southern, or which is often referred to as Faili, um, are, the three, are the three varieties. Uh, um, I'd like to move on to um, working with interpreters with limited training or certification, because many of the, um, of the interpreters that you work with, sorry, will be um, uh, will not have certification. Well, that's that's NATI certification, um, but it's uh, it's not always the case. And um, what we have here in Shabu and Shirin is actually um, interpreters who interpret in their variety of uh, Kurdish, but do have um, uh, certification in other. Other languages. In both cases, uh, in both cases, it's um, um, Persian. Um, maybe Shirin and uh, uh, Shabu, you could just talk about that for a minute um, about your own um, your own level of certification. And uh, um, because, of course, if you have got the technique well enough to pass a test, and you've got the ethics. Which, which the NATI tests um, um, sort of test you on, then in fact that's transferable to your other varieties. Um, maybe just a minute on that and tell us about your experiences there. Um, Shabu? Uh, I'm an interpreter, you know, NATI accredited level two as paraprofessional before we used to say. 
in Persian and also in Kurdish. And uh, I do both of job at the same level. And uh, it doesn't mean that because I have a recognition in Kurdish, the kind of job that I receive, it's less, you know, uh, and it's not as, we say, risky as the other jobs. And I try to get them done professionally, but still, uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, because of, uh, you know, cases, sometimes the Kurdish cases that I'm dealing with, maybe it's uh, way harder and, you know, than the Persian one. And, uh, but still in terms of the payments, it's, you know, it's less than the, you know, Persian one. And it's an issue, you know, for most of the interpreter. But uh, another problem is that uh, most of the, I used to live in uh, Adelaide, you know, and then um, I've seen heaps of, you know, interpreter, Kurdish one, they had no, even the recognition, but still they were able to get jobs, you know. And then uh, I think that training makes interpreters fully acquainted with the process and requirements of most clients. And uh, for those, and also for myself, I think the agency every now and then have to, you know, design a specific kind of training to be updated and also to meet the needs of those, uh, you know, clients on uh, the training and also the experience. I think that on the other hand, experience allow them to adjust with their needs and preferences of a client. I've seen some providers managed uh, the workload of their non-credential interpreters by only giving them low risk jobs. And that's a thing which I have seen, but I think that uh, training in my view, and it's a big deal. And I really appreciate if the agencies, you know, look into that and yeah, they consider it as a factor. Good, thank you. Uh, Shirin, could you add a bit to that? Uh, I'm sorry, I think you're muted. Oh yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. 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 Um, yeah, with my case the same, I have, um, I have tenable uh, three uh, in Farsi um, and whatever the highest level of accreditation, which is only recognition available at NATI, majority of Kurds, the Kurdish interpreters that I know have obtained it, um, but because the NATI doesn't have a higher level um, of testing available, therefore um, the highest, the GC within the Kurdish community of the interpreters is recognition. Um, but as Shabu said, like if I have been uh, working as um, a professional interpreter for over 10 years in providing services in Farsi with level three, then therefore um, I am aware of the, um, the conducts, the ethics and everything else that comes with, with the job. Um, I think, as I said before, that it is important to uh, get clarification from the clients that what dialects of Kurdish they require. Um, it's also important that when you, the agencies, the stakeholders make re requests for interpreters, specifically ask for that dialect um, because, and, and for the agencies to, to provide the interpreters based on the dialect they speak like to have a bracket, fairly you know, in a bracket. Because a lot of clients, when you tell them Southern, they're not familiar with Southern. Mm. They only know Faili. So I don't think there is any use to having a, a term on the system which is not familiar to the clients. So if you just say Faili, the client said yes, then when you're make a booking for an interpreter, tell the agency you want Faili and no other style. Because majority of Faili's, it's hard for them to understand any other dialect. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll uh, just to uh, go back to the um, the, uh, the PowerPoint for a while. Um, look, um, because you will be often uh, with interpreters who only have recognition, and recognition means um, they've never been tested. Um, but simply recognition means that they've they have been active in the area as as interpreters. Um, and uh, now more recently, there has been some training given to the recognition interpreters and under the new NATI system or the, the changes that they recently made. But um, still, for the most part, you're going to get a lot of people who have not been trained. And um, as, as our speaker said, uh, the training is essential. 
Um, look, we uh, don't have time to give you a full uh, idea of how you deal with uh, interpreters who are not trained, but um, one uh, particular thing that I uh, always stress, um, uh, I don't know if uh, you've ever heard a service provider ask their uh, non-English speaker, do you understand? Which is the most useless question that you can ever, un uh, ever, ever take because almost universally the answer is, of course, yes, yes. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Um, so what I always um, recommend to um, service providers is what I call the mirror technique. Um, it's written about in, in interpreting textbooks. Um, we actually um, ask the Kurdish speaker to render back um, what was said through the interpreter so that you can confirm that. Um, and that gives you a degree of control over the interpreter. As soon as the interpreter knows that you're, 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 you're going to ask that or you, you ask that several times, um, they've got to be very accurate in what they're, in what they're giving back. It's, um, it, it's a simple technique, um, but it is so much better than uh, uh, asking the question, do you understand, and letting the person go out the door. Short, I think you've got some uh, yeah. some comments to make. Yes, I have some comments. Very quick. Uh, first, you showed a map. Actually, I want to, I'd like to show the maps a while ago that Google uh, uh, published map of Kurdistan, but I think because Turkish government were very uh, uh, and aggressive, they removed that. That uh, actual, I can say, map of Kurdistan, which uh, is... You need to about, put it closer to the camera and, yes, and watch yeah. what it... Uh, screen, you yes. see all the parts, like for example, on the north, which is see all the uh, north of Kurdistan, and the east, which is the west of Iran, and uh, Iraq. However, uh, this is the actual map of all cities of Kurdistan, all four parts of Kurdistan. And it comes to uh, the city here, Skanderuna, on the mid uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. One thing is very important, as uh, my friend mentioned, Shabu. Uh, one thing very important we know in Turkey, a Kurdish they're not allowed to speak Kurdish and educate by Kurdish language. Most uh, very previous time, the Kurdish people they were uh, written by uh, uh, Arabic scripts at the time of the Osmani Empire, and by the time when Kemal Atatürk came, changed to uh, Latin. So you see the first time uh, Kurdish uh, newspaper issued by Arabic script in uh, uh, 1882. That was the, the, the first time with the Kurdish uh, newspaper until now we memorize every time in uh, uh, Arabic. In Iran, the Kurdish people, they allowed to speak Kurdish as she mentioned, not allowed to educate, uh, are written by uh, Kurdish, which is uh, Arabic script, they're written by Persian. In Iraq before, and, and now as, until Saddam is gone, I think uh, after that as well, Kurdish allowed to speak, to write in Kurdish and uh, speak in Kurdish. In Syria, no. Speaking by Kurdish language, because they speak in, but not written by uh, Kurdish language, by Arabic. So that was very difficult. Uh, for Kurdish people when uh, say uh, when publish something uh, in Kurdish language you have to uh, do it in uh, sometime in three uh, scripts uh, Latin and Kurdish and uh, Arabic. Uh, the other thing is very important to interpreters know about that uh, the uh, dialect family it's uh, covered uh, because at the time of the Mats Empire the biggest uh, empire at that time was fairly, was fairly West Camp Perry. It fairly came for the king of that time was Kurdish, his name Billy. Then by the time it changed to Billy, was covered Ilam, uh, Khanakin, Kut, Amara, Baghdad, Diyala, Khanakin, all that controlled about that, that king. And by the time it changed to become uh, until when the uh, borders divided by Iraq and Iran. 
Uh, that important thing uh, we have okay, to know. Look, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll actually go on to that immediately because um, on the uh, on the PowerPoint I've got some points about the um, about the politics um, and and I want to go on to that and and actually talk about this because we're really talking about the the nation without a state um, and maybe we can go through some of these points and you can continue these points because I think they're um, they're, they're very important. Um, you mentioned in uh, with Northern um, Kurdish Kurmanji um, that there were uh, very severe periods of repression in Turkey, um, uh, but there is more uh, official and semi-official recognition of that now. And that actually came about for an interesting point that um, uh, Turkey at one point was interested in joining the European Union and the European Union replied, no, only if you can actually recognise the Kurds as a minority and, and actually um, uh, treat them in a, in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, uh, uh, so um, the, the Turkish situation, which I, I think many people did know about, um, the, there is now more official recognition. Um, the other aspect of, of Kurmanji, of course, is that it's also the common language of the uh, Ezidi, um, who don't necessarily identify as Kurds, but um, uh, they, uh, they speak Kurmanji. So you've got this crossover of, of ethnic groups um, and language. Um, there is no Ezidi language as such. Um, but uh, the, they, they will also speak northern, northern Kurmanji. And um, uh, the Kurds were also seriously oppressed under Saddam Hussein regime. I think both several speakers have referred to that. Maybe you could, you could pick up that point um, about the repression under, uh, under Sama, uh, Saddam Hussein. Yeah, at the time when Saddam Hussein was in power, uh, the Kurdish people here dispersed by uh, Saddam, but uh, the language was using that time was Kurdish because I was that time living in the south of Kurdistan, which is north of Iraq, and we were written by Kurdish language as well. He changed it for a couple of, I think for one year to Arabic, but uh, people did not accept it. Kurdish people, they uh, did a demonstration, many things, so it came back to uh, Kurdish language. And the one thing very important we mentioned uh, for about that reputation with my, my colleagues, they said, uh, we have, the Kurdish people, we have accreditation in Australia because I think in, uh, very early, it's uh, in 91, 92, uh, then small number of people came and they test and they give them accreditation. But that's, uh, I'm sorry to say about that, that's not correct because I was a Christmas Island and my colleagues know there was a, a, a people, interpreters, they are Turk, uh, but they give them accreditation because they speak a little bit Kurdish. Uh, even the, she, she or he didn't know uh, Kurdish fairly at all, and she interpreted for Kurdish people. I said, you don't know Kurdish Sorani, how you can interpret for Kurdish fairly? It's very difficult. So uh, for Kurdish uh, accreditation or recognition, why we don't have it? Because uh, there is not uh, like a standard language here to test all the, all the Kurds, you say, fairly Sorani altogether, uh, and give them a, a recognition uh, that were very difficult. Uh, just uh, we have uh, for many numbers, just we interpret uh, by experience, uh, not by recognition or by, not by certificate as well. Because I know people uh, with these was all agencies, they're working by experience for Kurdish language. That, uh, that is very uh, important. And the, the number of Kurds, if we divided the Kurdistan by population, the by numbers, the first population of Kurdish come from south of Turkey, which is nearly 25 million Kurds. And the second part is, which is the east, which is Iran, the west of Iran, from the Urmia until, until uh, uh, Ilan, that nearly 15,000. And the smallest, Syria, 3,000, and Iraq, 7,000. Uh, million, and, I think. Uh, million, yes. <laughs> three, uh, 3 million in Syria and 7 million in north of Iraq, which is south of Kurdistan. But we, uh, we have to uh, not forget the east of Iran, which is Khuzestan. That the, the people there is Kurds, and they recognize them as a Kurd. 
uh, that very important. Uh, they have a very different dialect. Uh, I haven't seen the people from there, but uh, they have a long history from the Meds Empire and after that, and they have a many revolution and demonstration against all the system in Iran until now they recognize themselves as a Kurd. That's very important because I think it didn't mention in the, the map, the east of Iran, that the uh, Khuzestan is very important. We, we know that. Mm -hmm. Good. And the SD, the SD, uh, uh, they are, we'll they are talk Kurd. about the Azidi yes. in, a, in a minute. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and, and talk about the Azidi. Um, uh, just if I can go back to the, uh, the PowerPoint again. Um, so um, now, uh, after the 1991 Gulf War, um, in fact, there has been a region in the north of Iraq which is now recognised as as a Kurdish region. Um, they have local autonomy, um, and they've been very important in the subsequent conflicts um, that are too complicated to go into here in uh, in, in in Iraq. Um, but this has been a sort of the, the the situation now where the Kurds have actually uh, managed to obtain a degree of recognition, uh, and that's international recognition, um, and this province, which is, which, which is now under, under their control. That hasn't stopped all the conflicts. There are many other conflicts as well, um, but we'll, um, uh, uh, it's certainly uh, one change in the status of the, um, uh, of, of, of the Kurdish language there. Um, in, uh, in Iraq, uh, and uh, with Kurdish um, Sarani, um, uh, we now have uh, uh, a higher status for um, um, for Kurdish Sarani in Iraq. It's a second official language, um, and I don't know if any of the speakers would like. Um, Shabul, would you like to talk about about that in uh, uh, the, the situation? Not so much in, in Iran, but in Iraq. We'll get into Iran in a minute. Well, honestly, uh I have no information about Iraq, uh, I think, but for Iran, yeah, just, uh, you know, as I told you, the kind of Kurdish that I speak has been kind of, you know, blended with Persian. And where I do remember the very first time when I traveled to Kurdistan of Iraq, and I, at that time, the border wasn't official and just something like interview being done, what's the reason to go, you wanna travel there. And when I was asked about that, I couldn't get, you know, what they asked me. And yeah, and at, I had some problem. I speak Sorani and when I traveled there, I couldn't get most of the things, you know? And it took me a while to educate myself because later on I managed to publish a book in Kurdistan of Iraq, which is called Easy Method. It was from Kurdish Sorani to English for those person who wanted to learn, you know, daily speaking English. And it took me a while to get there because, you know, that loan vocabulary is the Arabic one and some, you know, structure made me, made it difficult for me to understand. And still, maybe I don't have, if, if I have time to mention this, uh, even uh, it's more than language, it's something politic, you know. Kurdish question is uh, one of the questions which remains unsolved due to several internal and you know, external factors. And one of the reasons is being divided between four countries in the region. And also another uh, reason is because this being occupied, this occupied area, you know, they have a geopolitical importance. That's why even sometimes for the Kurdish people, they're speaking the same Sorani, some problems comes up. For example, once I was translating for a Kurdish, you know, of the part of Iraq, and the sentence was very straightforward. Okay, we managed to get a place for you near the station. I did that and I tried to, maybe my accent and pronunciation is not just like them, but I picked the right words and structure. And when I say, pass the message to him, the client told me, oh, she's not Kurdish, she's Irani. Just change her, change her, the only, you know, and it really made me feel terrible because, you know, and I said, okay, I have recognition. I've been doing this job and yeah, the professional got so angry and said, yeah, earlier we provided another interpreter said, okay, he is Arabic. I don't want him. And that's the problem. It's me. My point is we as an interpreter, 
we're doing Sorani, Pele, Kumanji, we have this issue related to politics. I'm not a person, I'm not into politics at all, but because of situation, my job, sometimes I've been dragged into politics. And I try to abide to the code of ethic. I try to be impartial. I try to do my job professionally, but still I can't be affected by that because deep down I'm a human. That's why Sorani, my point is Sorani that nowadays is spoken in part of Iran, in Kurdistan, somehow is different from Sorani, which is spoken in Kurdistan of Iraq. And that's why most of the time the client specifically, you know, asks, okay, I want a Kurdish interpreter from Iran, which doesn't make sense, honestly. If it is Kurdish, it's not Iran, you know? That's why sometimes, as Shirin mentioned, mentioning the place of birth may help. Okay, where were you born? Iran? Okay, Kurdish? Maybe it helps. But I don't have info related to the Kurdish Sorani in Iraq. Right, good. We've got another question from a participant that I'll get to in a minute. But just to finish off uh, here on uh, um, this uh, 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 nation without a state um, with uh, the Southern Kurdish, um, that had its own history. Um, so Southern Kurdish or Faili, um, as the participants call it. Um, uh, so there's always been resistance on the part of the Kurds to the Iranian government at, at various times. Um, and uh, there was uh, uh, quite a deal of uh, uh, simmering revolt um, while the Shah of Iran was uh, in power. Um, but uh, that uh, resistance has actually increased since the, Iran, um, the Islamic Revolution of 1979. So once again, the politics is uh, constantly, constantly with us. Um, and uh, there are very strong assimilationist pressures from the Shiite majority. We've already, already uh, heard the, uh, uh, the lower status of the Kurds in, uh, in, in, in Iran. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, a point that uh, is very important is that uh, many Kurds actually see affinities with Iranian culture. Um, not everyone supports necessarily a resistance or separation. Um, and this is an ongoing thing that, that, that not every, every Kurd is, is, if you like, paying for a, um, uh, a, separate, uh, a separate part of, um, uh, uh, of, of, of Iran or separatism from Iran. But, uh, but certainly these, these, um, um, these conflicts have been there as part of the history of the Kurds in, in, in Iran. Um, I'd like to move on to some issues of religion and culture. Um, the, uh, uh, obviously, a lot of the people um, from this area are from rural areas, um, but the experience of the people and certainly the people coming to Australia, um, many have had um, experience of uh, uh, all kinds of dislocation, uh, times in refugee camps, um, but also there's been some who have been integrated and are urban, um, and, and particularly that's the case in, in pre-revolutionary Iran, less so perhaps in, in, in Turkey and Syria. In terms of religion, um, it's largely Sunni Muslim, but uh, Shia also, and Shabu, you mentioned that in, uh, or was it Shirin, sorry, um, <laughs> Uh, uh, who mentioned that many in uh, in Iran are uh, are Shia um, rather uh, rather than Sunni, but certainly in the rest of Kurdistan, it's more likely to be um, uh, to be uh, 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 to be Sunni. However, um, there's also a number of minority religions. We've already heard Christian, Jewish, and so on. There's uh, the Middle East is simply a melting pot of every possible. Um, uh, religion. Um, if you can remember the Monty Python show of the life of Brian, um, you see how many competing religions there are in this tiny space. And this 
this incredibly creative area in terms of religion that has created so many different religions. And uh, I, I thought it might be good now for, um, to have a little bit from Shorsh about the Ezidi. Now, um, I'll just keep this up for a minute um, because this is the description of the Ezidi that I found. Um, it, it's a religion that's monotheistic. Uh, this is the group that, that speaks Kurmanji for the most part, but doesn't identify as Kurdish. It's got way, the religion goes back to certainly pre-Christian, pre-Islamic times, Mesopotamian religions, Abrahamic uh, religions, and a wonderful angelic tradition where God made seven angels to help him create the world and Adam and Eve. And so if you can imagine this kind of mixture of, uh, of uh, uh, a very interesting religion, um, but um, this is a separate uh, group. Um, it is uh, strong in many regional areas of Australia now, um, particularly Armadale, Wagga Wagga, but also you'll find them in, in the Azidi and capital cities in Sydney, Melbourne, um, and I'm sure there'll be some in Perth as well. Um, uh, Shorsh, maybe you could just give a few minutes on the on the Azidi. Yes, uh, just briefly. Thank you. Yes, uh, very quick. Uh, actually, Azidi people uh, they are Kurdish because to them uh, religion is related to Zoroastrian religion, which is the uh, original Kurdish religion uh, at the time of Medes Empire until the Islam came, and uh, at the time of Omar bin Khattab, they pushed and. Uh, uh, invaded Kurdistan and fight with, with the Kurdish people to accept Islam. Uh, and uh, in Kurdistan, uh, actually nowadays, uh, Kurdish uh, religion, which is Russian, came again, again uh, since 2015. There's so many places in Sulaymaniya and Erbil, they call in people uh, to come back to uh, Zoroastrian. That why, uh, actually I say, that why ISIS, they was fight they were and now as, as well come again fight with Kurdish people they and now they declare us as a not good Muslim because they said in Quran comes says we have to fight Kurdish people they are not good Muslim they are not uh, uh, accept Muslim in good way and one thing uh, we have to know for everyone the Kurdish people uh, in my opinion they are the best people and very open to accept all the religion in Kurdistan, we have a uh, Yazism, uh, as my friend said, which is uh, very related, related for Zarastria. And we have a uh, uh, Baha'i that new comes to uh, Kurdistan nowadays. And we have a uh, uh, Muslim Sunni when the Islam is gone. And we have a uh, Shia at the down, as uh, my friend Shirin said, in Ilam and Khanak India, they close to uh, Iranian and uh, Baghdad, the south of Iraq. They are Shia, they are affected by that uh, place and they accepted uh, uh, Shia. And uh, the other thing very uh, important uh, uh, for uh, our people, we have to interpret is they have to know uh, something historically about the Kurds. Not everyone became interpreter and they don't know anything. Uh, I can't accept that it's a part of politics, but you have to know something about Kurd as your interpreter. Uh, religion, uh, culture, uh, geography, and however, uh, uh, historically, you have to know something about the Kurd when they were located. Uh, as I said, Kurdish SD, uh, we have as well a Kurdish Alawi, Alawi that they are living in the uh, north of Kurdistan in Turkey. They are uh, Imam Ali followers as well. Uh, they can say uh, Shia as well. So, but by the time when Islam comes, uh, many people affected in different areas of Kurdistan, they accept Islam different things, like a Shia, Alawi, and Sunni. Nothing happened, but uh, actually, uh, the Kurdish people, you have to know, they are originally uh, Zoroastrian uh, religion, before uh, Persian people came to Iran. And the, the things when, when, I, when my friend said uh, there are similarity between, between Persian and Kurd, because they pick up most words from Kurdish, the Kurdish people older than Persian. That historically, we cannot deny that. And the, the, the uh, problem set by my friend in, uh, in Turkey, uh, what we said we have a difficulty in the Kurdish community because until now the Turkish government deny Kurdish people. They say we have a 
Turk mountain, as she said, Persian mountain in Iran has become language of local, and Turkey the same. The Turkish mountain, they have to, don't have a Kurdish as well at all in, uh, in Turkey. But in Iraq, we have a uh, good luck. After Saddam is gone, we have a Kurdistan region government, and we have a, a Kurdish language, the official and first language in the school and everywhere in, the, in Kurdistan. That's why my friend uh, was had a difficulty in Kurdistan when it came to Kurdistan region because the Kurdish people, after Saddam, they read of Arabic, all the language they speak in pure Kurdish language. And they bring a Kurdish word by universities, by uh, elite people uh, they educated to, to make a Kurdish people very uh, rich. That's why they are difficult uh, from Kurdish in the uh, east of uh, Kurdistan, which is Iran, which is Sorani, but uh, because we are speaking very pure, and uh, that bring, bring a uh, reality bring a difficulty for us because the new generation after Saddam, uh, then Arabic language is very poor. They, they cannot speak even in Iraqi parliament. We have a member of parliament, Kurdish in Iraqi parliament, they know speaking Arabic. That's very, very, uh, very bad for us because they don't understand uh, if they speak in Arabic very little uh, for some constitution or any bills comes from uh, Iraqi parliament, they, they don't know very good Arabic. Uh, they cannot how uh, they pass that bill in parliament so that uh, that makes for us a uh, difficult uh, but in iran uh, that uh, thing is for you easy and one thing that i remember for uh, my friends uh, about the uh, uh, accreditation uh, for you you get accreditation from persian even a uh, proper professional or level three uh, there's in, in persian but in college we don't have anything so now I'm, when I interpret Arabic uh, without uh, accreditation, just as I said, uh, just uh, I have a recognition because I'm speaking Kurdish, Kurdish language, but I can because I educated in Iraq in Arabic language, so my Arabic is, is no problem. I can speak very good, but I cannot get accreditation because still uh, I'm not good speaking an accent in, in, in Arabic. But uh, in Kurdistan region, uh, after Saddam, as I said, mentioned before, uh, we tried to speak very pure Kurdish language. It make it difficult even for Soranian people, like my friend uh, comes from in, uh, in, in the west, in the east uh, of Kurdistan, has a difficulty. But that thing, I think, related for a little bit politics because. Okay, well, I'd like to go. I'd like to go on to politics now because um, look, we have got a question. Uh, um, from uh, Samir Huzic. Uh, this may be too big a question, but I'm interested to know uh, how much has the Kurdish identity as such been impacted by the history of the whole group? And is that a reason why many might not identify as Kurds in the census in Australia? Um, now, that's a bigger political question, but clearly, um, there are many Kurds who will identify as Kurds, other Kurds who don't identify as Kurds, and this fracture, I think, has been historically there all the all all the, all the time. So it's really asking um, uh, that the that the that the history of the whole group and the various periods of repression and attempted assimilation, or uh, in some cases simply massacres has meant that people um, often will not identify as Kurds. And so even in Australia, it's, it's hard to know how many Kurds there are in, in the Kurdish region. It's even hard to know how many Kurds there are in Australia, whether they will answer those questions as having Kurdish ancestry or not, because many people there from the Middle East can choose a whole range of ancestries, in fact, um, rather, than just, rather than just one. Um, I'd like all this. Can I add something here? Yeah. Less than a minute. Yeah. Okay, in that is the eyes, you know, if I'm going to answer this question, in my view, it's so personal. You know, it's not about being identified as a Kurd. To me, it's about the right which should be established for me. As a very, you know, vivid example, parents are banned from registering their babies with certain Kurdish names. I'm one of them. My daughter, as I told you, she's 24. When she was born, I picked some, you know, 
Kurdish name, which were so normal when I went to the registry, because a list was, you know, provided and it, every name should be, you know, listed in that specific book or whatever. And they didn't accept those name which I presented. And that's why since then, since the, you know, my baby, my daughter, she's 24, I call her something else. I call the name which I like, but every document, everything's in, in that name, which even she doesn't like that. And even she's not happy about that. This is a very basic right, you know, it's not politic. It's a, my right that I like to choose a name for my baby. You know, that's, I think the number is not important. They, you know, just practicing and also establishing the rights. And later on, we talk about women being a Kurdish women in those countries. I'm going to talk about that if you let me later on. Okay, thank you. Look, we'll move, we'll move on. Um, uh, as you can see, just the amount we have to cover is, is, is enormous. And, uh, um, but I, I, would, I would like to cover some more things. I would like to cover gender issues. And um, clearly, uh, just a couple of points on the PowerPoint before I turn it over to Shireen and Shabu. Um, traditional gender roles in former village societies um, were very traditional. However, um, women have been very much politicised and um, even joined the military um, very clearly this has been happening um, from World War I uh, up to the present day and particularly in, in, recent, uh, in recent decades. Now, um, uh, I suppose what, how we could contrast it is to say there's this um, continual battle uh, and probably not in, in, in the Kurdish area alone between uh, anti-women behaviour on the, on the one hand, because there still are honour killings, there's female genital mutilation, there's forced marriages, and on the other hand, progressive movements which really stress the role of women in social and political and even military life. So, um, and uh, we have uh, heard just recently some incidents of honour killings which surprised people in Europe um, which uh, were, were from among, among Kurds, which was uh, um, a, a really, um, a, a, some really horrible events there of uh, honour killings. But I also found this in the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is an online uh, encyclopedia now, which says that along with um, Kurdish men, Kurdish women, who traditionally have been more active in public life than Turkish, Arabic and Iranian women, especially in pre-revolutionary Iran, have taken advantage of urban educational and employment opportunities. So this is a very uh, mixed picture. And um, Shirin, maybe I'll start with you. Could, you. could you talk about some of these issues that I think are, are ongoing in, um, in, 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 the, in the Kurdish areas? Sure. I mean, not just in Kurdish area, but in Kur with the Kurdish communities all around the world, like any other community. The, the unfortunate thing with media, especially, is that they just pick what they want the rest of the, the rest of the community to be aware of. Like if there was an honor killing with one family out of almost 40 million in part of Europe, that gets uh, puts on a platform and people will be notified of it. But the, for the past 10 years, the women in Kurdistan um, have been fighting alongside the males for their freedom, for the freedom of not just the Kurds, for the Arabs as well, for the Syrians, for the Iraqis, to protect other humans. And there are females that, like the Women Protection Unit, the YPG, has been going strong since, um, I think, 2013 until present time. Um, we have to keep in mind that it's 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 fine to uh, talk about like just incidents that happens here and there, but with a, in my experience and the knowledge that I have about my own community, is that we are even our language is gender neutral. We don't emphasize on the role of men and role of women separately. Um, our men are not the typical majority of them obviously there are always uh, circumstances that they typical like you know classify them as typical middle eastern men but kurdish men are usually 
space than men. They allow their female to um, be free to participate in communities as, as positive members where they fight alongside each other for generations. So it's, um, I mean, the role of gender within Kurdish community, I think it's massive. As one of my lecturers in uni said that um, female Kurds, and especially um, the, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, um, is the one to be symbolized and to study it as how this, this gender play um, a significant role, especially the females within the rest of the Middle East. If you compare the Kurdish woman to Arab woman or the Persian woman, I believe that I, I grew up in Iran. And if you walk down the street and you say, I'm Kurdish, no one dares to you know, mess up with, mess with you. <laughs> like, we, we're known to be the, the strong characters all around. <laughs> <laughs> at least contemporary uh, history. <laughs> That's a very good. Um, okay, we, uh, we won't mess with you. Uh, Shabu, maybe you can <laughs> add something there. <laughs> yeah, about women uh, and specifically Kurdish women. You know, today many Kurdish women in Iran are part of the labor force and participate in politics and other civic duties. Women are still, but still victim of sexual violence, as you said, honor killing, and also suicide due to Kurdish society and less progressive government, uh, Iranian government's law. You know, Kurdish women uh, face a double challenge to establish their rights. What I mean, as Kurds living in marginalized you know community and as women in a community governed largely by men in both cases they are subject to discriminatory laws and often uh, there is a quote among the kurdish women in iran which says that we are both women and kurds and living in an islamic country like iran we are doubly or twice accused you know, this is, and I've been working in Iran for 20 years at university, but I felt, you know, that kind of discrimination and that kind of thing, that point which I was. And sometimes too, because, you know, I've seen, it's not specifically for, you know, Kurdish women, maybe the other, you know, ethnicity, but I'm talking about them. To escape the violence and abuse some Kurdish girl, you know, and women, what they do, they go extreme and they start to self-harm and setting themselves on fire, which even some, you know, documentaries been made according to the life of the, you know, some Kurdish women, specifically in Elam, it's been kind of a cultural thing, you know, self-harm and specifically set on fire. And, you know, there is no silver bullet, you know, to advance women's rights in the Middle East, generally speaking. Well, building a society in which uh, women enjoy equal rights to men requires a combination of two things. One of them policies and laws, and the other one changing cultural, you know, mindsets. Speaking of, you know, Kurdish of Iran, you know, in terms of culture, you can see massive changes. But still, when I deal with some of my client Kurdish one, been living in Australia for a long time, I can feel and I can pick that specific cultural mindset. And that's why it ends having, uh, you know, heaps of conflicts, the family with their, you know, uh, kids, their kids. That's why, that's my point, you know, it's not that easy to be changed. Good, sure, yes, please. Uh, one thing is very important we say, uh, I think in a Kurdish uh, history and Kurdish civilization from the beginning until now, uh, the woman uh, has a very good role because if you look at the history of the Kurd, uh, during the history, many, many uh, leaders of the tribal states it was, it was led by by women, and we have a very good histories. Even my friends know Khan uh, Dabzerin, Khalid Dim, and Hafsa Khan Naqib. And nowadays, you see uh, Yapaga, Yapaja, as uh, Shirin said, 
of all the ladies and girls, they fight in equal with the men. However, now if you look at the north of Iraq, which is south of Kurdistan, there's a very big tribal called Zebari. The leader of that tribal, that uh, one lady, and everyone listened to her, and she fixed everything. So we have the ministers, we have uh, uh, many things. Now in, in, in Rojava, in uh, Syria, there's a, a man and woman, they lead in Rojava uh, together. The same role, same power, same thing. I think the Kurdish community and the Kurdish society very open, and they treated women very good by history until now. The one thing affected, uh, Shavu said, uh, I'm sorry I said that, that uh, Islamic religion. When you see difference between women in Iran, they're treated by Islamic rules, and women lead in the Kurdistan region, which is not Islamic rule. You see ministers, you see uh, they are very free, they do doing everything. Uh, uh, as I said, they say it's different. Uh, in Turkey, it's the same. The, you see the uh, Kurdish girls, Kurdish women, here as well. When you see the Kurdish women, there's never, uh, never you see the problem. But that thing when uh, has happened in, in Europe, I think in every co in the society, every community, it happens. One or two, you cannot compare or you cannot put this measure for the culture of the society. That's very difficult. But in general, the Kurdish history and the Kurdish society, they are very good with women and they are very respected. And during the history was girls and women leading the, the Kurdish society. I think uh, that I that do agree with what you said. Maybe it's not a place to say, but you have to look at everything from the eye of the women. What you say, they sound beautiful and they are right, but still you should be a woman and you should see how things are different. <laughs> Right, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, we've got a bit of background noise. There's something rolling down the street here at uh, at all graduates. Um, just to go back, and we're moving on to the end of our um, end of our uh, uh, presentation, and uh, um, with the uh, 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 with gender, and uh, we've just got a brief time, uh, really, to talk about education. Um, and uh, Australian institutions um, before we before we wrap up. Um, now we've heard already, I think, the difference between low educational levels, often because of disrupted schooling, um, long periods of conflict uh, where there's been no schooling, um, the migration patterns, uh, detention, all of those factors have led. Um, so uh, disrupted schooling has certainly been the uh, uh, the, the norm for, for many Kurdish groups, but um, there's also been a, uh, a proportion of much better educated from uh, the urban areas, and that's been uh, that's been very um, uh, significant. And of course, like all refugee communities and I've not been able to find an exception yet from any refugee communities. There are often very high aspirational levels for education because very often, and, and this is also the case in, in Kurdistan itself, you often did not have land, you did not have capital, you did not have connections with uh, important people, um, and education was the only way, in fact, that you could get ahead. So I, I think that's, um, that's fairly uh, important, I think, to understand. And there was always an alternative to um, education, which was trading and entrepreneurship. And like many other minorities, Kurds have also been very active in entrepreneurship uh, and so on. We know that in Australia, for example, a disproportionate number of our migrants create small businesses. And, and actually are involved in business more than the, the majority Australian population. And, and, and certainly that's the, um, that's the case. Um, and um, just the last few um, items here in terms of familiarity with Australian institutions. Obviously, when you're interpreting and so on, yes, many of the systems that are in Australia are simply were not there in Kurdistan ever. Um, whether it was welfare, whether it was uh, significant public administration and so on. 
um, the way the police operate or so on was was very different. We've already heard of that, um, uh, the, the, the problems of healthcare and so on. But um, above this, there really is this important, um, uh, uh, important desire to actually fit in with Australia, to actually make this their home, and very much to have high education aspirations and to contribute to the society, whether it's through education and professions um, or through entrepreneurship. And uh, maybe I could just get all three of you because we're at the at the end of our presentation, um, just to give a brief a brief summary of, of where you feel the the um, uh, the Kurdish population and group is here now in in Australia. And, and how you would sum up this situation. Maybe Shosh? Yeah, and, uh, about the Kurdish uh, uh, people here, I think uh, they're doing a good thing because uh, they joined the Kurdish Association. Uh, actually, uh, maybe my friend knows or not, uh, we have a free uh, Kurdish Association in Melbourne. Uh, the biggest one in Faulkner, uh, the other two in, uh, the other one in Tombstone, and the other one in, in Epping. They do very good because uh, they do in some time a course for Kurdish language. And we have a Kurdish radio program, which is, I, I'm a director for that program since 2006. And we could do good things, uh, always we invite people, we do an interview, we uh, publishing a good information about uh, how you improve your language, how you uh, uh, doing a good, uh, yeah, like how you cope with the Australian system, how you obey the, the rules, everything we we uh, doing but the one thing is uh, very upset about the, at the beginning we said that people they don't uh, uh, identify themselves uh, as a Kurd which we always I personally am uh, uh, speaking about it every time in my program please identify yourself as a Kurd because make it easier for Australian government make it easier for yourself when uh, you need an interpreter that very good don't identify yourself by uh, the country because uh, that uh, politically is a different because when you say i'm iraqi set away they know you're arab or when you go say i'm from iran say oh i'm special or in syria and turkey are the same so it's better you identify yourself by uh, the language and very important thing the last thing for me is a very good interpreter should know everything about the Kurd for Kurdish interpreter, geography, history, culture, and because uh, sometimes you're doing like a, one word between uh, Elam and Sulaymaniyya for one thing, for example, line. Maybe they say different word and Sulaymaniyya and Sorani different word and in uh, Kurdish command different word. So you, you have to know everything, geographically, history, culture, language about all Kurdistan. For, for interpreter, that's very important. Good, thank you. Um, Shabu, one minute uh, <laughs> to sum up the Kurdish situation. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I've been living in Melbourne for three years and I haven't got a chance to be mingled with Kurdish community. But uh, when I used to live in Sydney and, you know, Adelaide, uh, yeah, I used to take part in the gathering and some of the, they were per perfect. And also my daughter got the chance, you know, to get uh, to join the, you know, youth group, youth uh, association. And, you know, that's what I really needed for her because she could get picked the best things about my culture and also to mingle that with the Australian culture. That's why while I was there, I was quite happy about specifically the youth, you know, association I'm talking about. And uh, yeah, and gave me a chance to feel, you know, being at home again and also to mingle with, uh, and I practice my language, my culture and so on. And Shirin, uh, you get the final word. Well, whatever my colleague says, it covers most of it. Um, I think as what Shirish said, it is very important to put the information session or uh, training sessions in place for newly arrived migrants to inform them about like, um, domestic violence and what that means within the Australian context because that can mean something very different within Middle East context within Iran or Iraq separate from each other than what is in Australia. I think when I worked in detention centers in um, Darwin um, there was a great deal of uh, these educational sessions that um, most of the refugees were provided with the classes 
to explain to them the role of the police in domestic violence, what action the government or the court might take against the male or the female. Um, I think those kind of education will be essential to kind of bring communities together. And I worked in a lot of courts these days, I mean, uh, even bef maybe before Corona. Um, and you do see a lot of uh, issues with domestic violence um, within the Persian and also the Kurdish community. So it's good if they know the law and how it looks like. Good, thank you very much. We've come to the end of the of the webinar. I should say for the um, uh, for uh, the participants um, now, um, you'll receive a copy of the recording. Uh, this has been recorded, so you'll receive a copy of that recording in a follow-up email. Um, It'll also include a short survey, so you can tell us how good we were or not. Um, in the next few days also, um, uh, all graduates will be sending a follow-up email with, with uh, some summary notes of the seminar. And um, please keep a lookout for um, future programs like this. There is a new learning management platform which is being set up. Everyone is now on Zoom or a hundred other ways of seeing each other in these small little squares all over the world. Um, it's a new art form um, and there will be further training and resources by All Graduates, um, which tries to live up to its name, All Graduates, i.e. that you are trained um, and that training is essential. And I think that's a very good point that uh, it's often uh, not only the interpreters who need training, but um, uh, also service providers, um, but also uh, in this case, the, the Kurdish speakers themselves. I'd like to thank you um, and our three main participants, uh, Shor, Shabu and Shirin, um, for this session and we'll end the session uh, now. Thank you very much for participating and see you again at some future or graduate session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.